we have Professor Steve Jones of University College London, who is Professor of Genetics and Head of Department there. He was educated at the University of Edinburgh. He's a prolific writer on evolution and genetics, uh, specializing originally on the population genetics of snails, but being very well known in addition for his work in Britain in the media. His recent works include In the Blood, God, Genes, and Destiny, Language of the Genes, Biology, History, and the Evolutionary Future, Why, The Descent of Men, Coral, and this year, Darwin's Island. And he will focus on evolution of society. Um, I'm told, to my alarm, that I have to eight minutes in which to explain the evolution of society. Um, <laughs> that should be easy enough. Um, I also have to say, I, I'm remi reminded, uh, I was reminded during this morning's session of the tale of the 18th century playwright who went to a play by Sheridan and stormed out in fury because Sheridan had used a device, a metal sheet, which he rumbled to make the sound of a distant lightning storm. And the playwright has forgotten everything apart from what he shouted on the way out. He has stolen my thunder. Um, because this chap had invented the metal sheet, and to an extent the previous speakers have certainly stolen my thunder, perhaps Dan Dennett more than, uh, more, more than average. Um, Sheridan is also famous for having watched his own theater in Drury Lane burn down. He was warned for standing too near, and he said, sir, cannot a man stand by his own fireside? And I have to say, I did feel certain elements of the flames of hell ready to be licking around Dan Dennett's feet in particular, should he turn out to be wrong. Um, but I'm sure he won't. I think one of the great problems with trying to use evolution to understand society is that people who try to do that do not understand the limits of evolution, evolution's explanatory power. Indeed, I think I fear that some of them do not understand the limits of science's explanatory power. Um, I was given an insight into that um, a few weeks ago when, I, somewhat to my surprise, I found myself talking at St. Paul's Cathedral and with typical ineffectiveness. I'd forgotten what I was supposed to be talking about. So a couple of minutes before it began, I asked uh, the reverend gentleman who introduced me, what am I supposed to be talking about? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, you're going to tell us why we are here. <laughs> and my mind went to characteristic blank. Um, but I got into the pulpit there, I had a moment of insight, and I said, well, I don't know why we are here, but I know why I'm here. It's because you couldn't get Richard Dawkins. <laughs> but that can't, that can't be true today because he's sitting in the front row. Um, so what I want to suggest to you is actually there has been a grotesque amount of overlap explanation of human society by people who refer to evolutionary um, analogy. Uh, Charles Darwin has a, one of his many wonderful phrases, which I frequently refer to. He's right somewhere, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And I fear that there's been rather too more confidence than there has been knowledge um, in various attempts to understand ourselves, to understand society, possibly even to understand religion in Darwinian terms. Certainly we can learn something about society from looking at the animal world, but that something is rather obvious. Um, the judge who condemned Masawi, the supposed or perhaps real co-conspirator in the 9-11 uh, uh, events, uh, Masawi made a plea bargain so he didn't get executed, but the worst thing you can do to, to human beings if you don't execute them to punish them, punish them is to put them in solitary confinement. And Masawi was put in solitary confinement in the Supermax prison in Colorado, and the judge who condemned him said, you will die with a whimper. Well, he's wrong, because Masawi will certainly die with a scream, because if you put people into solitary confinement, and this is real solitary confinement, they're fed on stuff which is called neutral loaf, which has no taste, to even limit the amount of sensory input they have in from outside. They go, without exception, they go mad. And that's because, of course, we descend from ancestors shared with a, uh, with a uh, social primate, ancestors shared with chimpanzees. If we descended, perhaps, from ancestors shared with a more solitary um, uh, primate, an orangutan, perhaps, the worst punishment you could give somebody would be to send them to a dinner party. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I've been to those dinner parties, one or two of, <laughs> one or two of them in Cambridge. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so clearly, there are, we can learn something from the animal world about human society, but only in the most general terms. And I'm horrified, I really am horrified, by some of the sociobiological arguments I hear regularly expounded with great confidence by people I think of as practicing art, arts, what I call arts faculty science. Um, Darwin described famously his mind as a machine for ge grinding general laws from a collection of facts. Theirs is a machine for grinding general laws from a collection of opinions, and that is not science at all. Um, uh, when I'm, um, I rather rarely argument, argue, try not to argue with creationists, so to try particularly not to argue with people of religious persuasion, but occasionally one's placed in a position you can't get away, get away from it. I've never really had a sensible discussion with either of those groups, simply because I do not understand their um, thought processes particularly. Uh, only one do I remember as being useful. Many years ago, 30 years ago now, to my horror, um, I spent a year working in Botswana, at the University of Botswana. And Botswana, as I'm sure you all know, uh, is, a high, is a highly successful uh, uh, southern African country, um, which is rich, has an excellent education system, an excellent health system, um, and it's very religious. One of the reasons, I have to say, and I accept it quite happily, is one of the reasons for its stability is that Scots Presbyterian missionaries got there, and uh, the place developed in a very positive and uh, ethical kind of way, which it's retained. Um, I taught a brief course in evolution, and I asked one of the students at the end how he, I remember his name, his name was Small Boy Electric, it's a difficult name to forget. I asked Small Boy Electric, uh, how do you, how do you uh, reconcile what I've been telling you about the immense um, age of the human species with your belief in the little truth of the Bible that it all happened 6,000 years or, or so ago? And he looked me straight in the eye and he gave me the perfect answer. He said, it's very simple, sir. You evolved, we were created. <laughs> but there is a, there's a point to that story, and it's a tragic point, because I'm almost certain that Small Boy Electric, who might then have been 18, and should not now perhaps be in his late 40s, I'm almost certain that he's dead. And I'm almost certain that more than half of the members of that uh, charming group of students who were in my uh, class are also dead, and that's because Botswana is, or was until last year, the world capital of the AIDS virus. Um, and the AIDS virus, HIV, is of course a wonderful microcosm of evolution in action. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that in general terms, so I won't talk about it in detail. But the microcosm which AIDS gives us really, to me, summarizes the way in which um, ev uh, evolutionary theory is very bad at understanding human society and human beliefs and human behavior. There is, of course, strong natural selection by the virus on any individual who is able to withstand it. And there are large numbers of different gene loci now involved which uh, can give greater or lesser protection against that uh, particular um, virus. People with uh, a, a particular variant on a, of a gene with the memorable title of CCL3L, if you have the um, variant number one and you have two copies of that variant and you become infected with HIV, your prospects of survival are very good. If you have no such, um, no such predictive variant, your prospects for survival are rather poor. And if I had a time machine, if I had the time machine now no doubt being designed in Cambridge University Engineering Department, and was to zoom forward 1,000 years, 2,000 years from now, if HIV were to continue as a universal plague, I can predict with some confidence that natural selection would have brought about the condition whereby everybody in the world um, has uh, uh, two copies of that particular variant, and HIV is no longer a dangerous disease. That, of course, is a Darwinian process. We don't have time machines that go forward, but we do have time machines that go back. And the time machines that go back are, of course, uh, other populations of human beings, our relatives like chimpanzees, our more distant relatives like fruit flies, and the rest. And this is CCL3 gene is an astonishing um, image of what Darwinism can, can achieve. One of the uh, surprises in the modern um, insight into genetics is the discovery that the genome is much more fluid than we thought, that particular genes can multiply themselves up, often many times, so that if you have an advantageous variant, sometimes you can double up the actual gene, the actual gene locus, so you end up with a kind of stuttering section of DNA with many, many copies of that particular gene. It transpires that on the average, Europeans, 
um, who have been exposed to HIV only in the last 25 or 30 years, and we're sure of that, have about three copies um, within a particular population. The average number of copies of the protective variant is about three. Africans, and it now looks very much as if HIV became a widespread scourge in Africa at the end of the 19th century when the uh, cities of Africa began to grow. They've got six. And chimpanzees, which have a related virus, which causes them no symptoms as far as we can see, and that goes back the infection rate much longer, have nine. And that's actually a perfect example of evolution in action. Um, that joins us, certainly, with the rest of the living world. But of course, we have an ability which is unique to ourselves. We can actually cope with HIV in a totally different way by with, uh, with, with competence with comprehension to modify uh, Dan Danette's quite memorable phrase, which I should certainly steal, and I'm sure most people in this room will do the same, because we have medicine, we have understanding, we have behavior. And in, Bot in Botswana itself, the rate of infection, the rate of transmission, has now dropped by half in the last 10 years through education. And that's unique to ourselves. And that, to me, and I'll end up in a moment, that, to me, is the center of the problem of arguments in about human society taken from evolution. Because evolution is overwhelmingly a comparative science. There is a whole aspect of evolutionary biology called cladistics, which tries to put observations of particular structures into the context of the creatures that share them and don't, and try to work out what their history, um, uh, their development has been over time. Everything that makes us human is unique. That's clearly the case. Um, and as a result, evolution is rather bad at explaining it. I'm reminded of a story that my father told me, um, which really illustrates that, and I don't think he realizes it. it. I had a rather uncanny experience last Friday uh, when I was asked by the BBC to go back to the house in which I was brought up, which is in West Wales on the coast of uh, near Aberystwyth. And I went back, and, um, and uh, it was very, very odd. I hadn't been inside it for 50 years. Um, and it had turned into a DOS house. <laughs> there were about 20 people living there. My bedroom ceiling had fallen down. It seemed to, seemed to say something useful about my life. I don't know quite what it was. Anyway, the story is, tur turns on Aberystwyth, one of the various Welsh-speaking DOSers in this house. Um, the, the tale goes that uh, in Aberystwyth in the 1950s when I was a boy, there was a solitary Chinese restaurant. And a Welsh-speaking customer went into the Chinese restaurant, ordered a Chinese meal, served, a, served this meal by a clearly Chinese uh, waiter who spoke perfect Welsh. And um, amazed by this, the uh, customer beckoned over the older and said to him, in Welsh, but I'll translate for you, he said to him, well, this is amazing, boy. Where do you get this fellow from? A Chinaman that speaks perfect Welsh. And the owner looked alarmed. He said, keep your voice down, boy. He thinks he's learned English. <laughs> And that, to me, is a, a perfect illustration of the weakness of, um, of trying to use e um, evolution to explain something unique. Because to a, well to a Chinese speaker, Welsh and English are the same language. Um, they're branches of the Indo-European language. And of course they are. But we only know that because we have a whole gamut of languages with which we can compare them. If everybody in the world spoke Welsh, we would understand nothing about where it came from. And the same is true about almost everything that makes us human. Society, religion, belief, all those things. We have no standard of comparison. So we are not taught using evolutionary biology properly when we try to use it to understand ourselves. In fact, to summarize my statement, um, I think evolution can tell you everything you need to know about yourself except for the interesting stuff. So I'll stop there. <laughs>